Neoconservatism commonly shortened to neocon when labeling its adherents is a political movement born in the United States during the 1960s among liberal hawks who became disenchanted with the increasingly pacifist foreign policy of the Democratic Party, and the growing new left and counterculture, in particular the Vietnam protests. Some also began to question their liberal beliefs regarding domestic policies such as the Great Society. Many of its adherents became politically famous during the Republican presidential administrations of the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s as neoconservatives peaked in influence during the administration of George W. Bush, when they played a major role in promoting and planning the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Prominent neoconservatives in the George W. Bush administration included Paul Wolfowitz, Elliot Abrams, Richard Pearl, and Paul Bremer. While not identifying as neoconservatives, senior officials Vice President Dick Cheney and Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld listened closely to neoconservative advisors regarding foreign policy, especially the defense of Israel and the promotion of American influence in the Middle East. Historically speaking, the term, neoconservative, refers to those who made the ideological journey from the anti-Stalinist left to the camp of American conservatism during the 1960s and 1970s. Neoconservatives typically advocate the promotion of democracy and American national interest in international affairs, including peace through strength by means of military force, and are known for espousing disdain for communism and for political radicalism. The movement had its intellectual roots in the Jewish Monthly Review magazine Commentary, edited by Norman Podhoretz and published by the American Jewish Committee. They spoke out against the New Left and in that way helped define the movement. Terminology The term, neoconservative, was popularized in the United States during 1973 by the socialist leader Michael Harrington, who used the term to define Daniel Bell, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and Irving Kristol, whose ideologies differed from Harrington's. The neoconservative label was used by Irving Kristol in his 1979 article. Confessions of a True, Self-Confessed Neoconservative. His ideas have been influential since the 1950s, when he co-founded and edited the magazine Encounter. Another source was Norman Podhoretz, editor of the magazine Commentary from 1960 to 1995. By 1982, Podhoretz was terming himself a neoconservative in the New York Times Magazine article titled, The Neoconservative Anguish Over Reagan's Foreign Policy. During the late 1970s and early 1980s, the neoconservatives considered that liberalism had failed and no longer knew what it was talking about. According to E.J. Dion, Seymour Lipset asserts that the term neoconservative was used originally by socialists to criticize the politics of Social Democrats, USA, SDUSA. Jonah Goldberg argues that the term is ideological criticism against proponents of modern American liberalism who had become slightly more conservative both Lipset and Goldberg are frequently described as neoconservatives. In a book-length study for Harvard University Press, historian Justin Vase writes that Lipset and Goldberg are in error, as neoconservative was used by socialist Michael Harrington to describe three men, noted above, who were not in SDUSA, and neoconservatism is a definable political movement. The term, neoconservative, was the subject of increased media coverage during the presidency of George W. Bush, with particular emphasis on a perceived neoconservative influence on American foreign policy, as part of the Bush Doctrine. History. Through the 1950s and early 1960s, the future neoconservatives had endorsed the American civil rights movement, racial integration, and Martin Luther King Jr. From the 1950s to the 1960s, there was general endorsement among liberals for military action to prevent a communist victory in Vietnam. Neoconservatism was initiated by the repudiation of the Cold War and the new politics of the American New Left, which Norman Podhoretz said was too close to the counterculture and too alienated from the majority of the population, Black Power, which accused white liberals and northern Jews of hypocrisy on integration and of supporting settler colonialism in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and anti-anti-communism, which during the late 1960s included substantial endorsement of Marxist-Leninist politics. 
Many were particularly alarmed by what they claimed were anti-Semitic sentiments from black power advocates. Irving Kristol edited the journal The Public Interest (1965–2005), featuring economists and political scientists, which emphasized ways that government planning in the liberal state had produced unintended harmful consequences. Many early neoconservative political figures were disillusioned Democratic politicians and intellectuals, such as Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who served in the Nixon and Ford administrations, and Jean Kirkpatrick, who served as United States Ambassador to the United Nations in the Reagan administration. A substantial number of neoconservatives were originally moderate socialists associated with the right wing of the Socialist Party of America and its successor, Social Democrats, USA Max Schachtman, a former Trotskyist theorist who developed a strong antipathy towards the New Left, had numerous devotees among SDUSA with strong links to George Meany's AFL-CIO. Following Schachtman and Meany, this faction led the SP to oppose immediate withdrawal from the Vietnam War, and oppose George McGovern in the Democratic primary race and, to some extent, the general election. They also chose to cease their own party building and concentrated on working within the Democratic Party, eventually influencing it through the Democratic Leadership Council. Thus the Socialist Party dissolved in 1972, and SDUSA emerged that year. Most of the left wing of the party, led by Michael Harrington, immediately abandoned SDUSA. SDUSA leaders associated with neoconservatism include Carl Gershman, Penn Kemble, Joshua Muravchik, and Bayard Rustin. Norman Podhoretz's magazine Commentary of the American Jewish Committee, originally a journal of liberalism, became a major publication for neoconservatives during the 1970s. Commentary published an article by Jean Kirkpatrick, an early and prototypical neoconservative, albeit not a New Yorker. <laughs> New York intellectuals Many neoconservatives had been Jewish intellectuals in New York City during the 1930s. They were on the political left, but strongly opposed Stalinism and some were Trotskyists. During the Cold War they continued to oppose Stalinism and to endorse democracy. The great majority became liberal Democrats. <laughs> Rejecting the American New Left and McGovern's New Politics As the policies of the New Left made the Democrats increasingly leftist, these intellectuals became disillusioned with President Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society domestic programs. The influential 1970 bestseller The Real Majority by Ben Wattenberg expressed that the real majority of the electorate endorsed economic interventionism, but also social conservatism, and warned Democrats it could be disastrous to adopt liberal positions on certain social and crime issues. The neoconservatives rejected the countercultural New Left and what they considered anti Americanism in the non interventionism of the activism against the Vietnam War. After the anti war faction took control of the party during 1972 and nominated George McGovern, the Democrats among them endorsed Washington Senator Henry Scoop. Jackson instead for his unsuccessful 1972 and 1976 campaigns for president. Among those who worked for Jackson were incipient neoconservatives Paul Wolfowitz, Doug Faith, and Richard Pearl. During the late 1970s, neoconservatives tended to endorse Ronald Reagan, the Republican who promised to confront Soviet expansionism. Neoconservatives organized in the American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage Foundation to counter the liberal establishment. In another 2004 article, Michael Lind also wrote, Neoconservatism originated in the 1970s as a movement of anti-Soviet liberals and social democrats in the tradition of Truman, Kennedy, Johnson, Humphrey and Henry Scoop, Jackson, many of whom preferred to call themselves paleoliberals, after the end of the Cold War. Many paleoliberals drifted back to the democratic center. Today's neocons are a shrunken remnant of the original broad neocon coalition. Nevertheless, the origins of their ideology on the left are still apparent. The fact that most of the younger neocons were never on the left is irrelevant, they are the intellectual and, in the case of William Crystal and John Podhoretz, the literal heirs of older ex-leftists. <laughs> Leo Strauss and his students 
C. Bradley Thompson, a professor at Clemson University, claims that most influential neoconservatives refer explicitly to the theoretical ideas in the philosophy of Leo Strauss (1899–1973), although there are several writers who claim that in doing so they may draw upon meaning that Strauss himself did not endorse. Neoconservatism draws on several intellectual traditions. Some have attributed them to political science professor Leo Strauss (1899–1973). Eugene Shepard notes, "...much scholarship tends to understand Strauss as an inspirational founder of American neoconservatism." Strauss was a refugee from Nazi Germany who taught at the New School for Social Research in New York (1939–1949) and the University of Chicago (1949–1958). Strauss asserted that the crisis of the West consists in the West's having become uncertain of its purpose. His solution was a restoration of the vital ideas and faith that in the past had sustained the moral purpose of the West. The Greek classics classical republican and modern republican, political philosophy and the Judeo-Christian heritage are the essentials of the great tradition in Strauss's work. Strauss emphasized the spirit of the Greek classics and Thomas G. West 1991 argues that for Strauss the American founding fathers were correct in their understanding of the classics in their principles of justice. For Strauss, political community is defined by convictions about justice and happiness rather than by sovereignty and force. He repudiated the philosophy of John Locke as a bridge to 20th-century historicism and nihilism and defended liberal democracy as closer to the spirit of the classics than other modern regimes. For Strauss, the American awareness of ineradicable evil in human nature and hence the need for morality, was a beneficial outgrowth of the premodern Western tradition. O'Neill notes that Strauss wrote little about American topics, but his students wrote a great deal and that Strauss's influence caused his students to reject historicism and positivism as morally relativist positions. They instead promoted a so-called Aristotelian perspective on America that produced a qualified defense of its liberal constitutionalism. Strauss's emphasis on moral clarity led the Straussians to develop an approach to international relations that Catherine and Michael Zucker call Straussian Wilsonianism or Straussian idealism, the defense of liberal democracy in the face of its vulnerability. Strauss influenced weekly standard editor William Crystal, William Bennett, Robert Bork, Newt Gingrich, Antonin Scalia, and Clarence Thomas, as well as military strategist Paul Wolfowitz. Jean Kirkpatrick A theory of neoconservative foreign policy during the final years of the Cold War was articulated by Jean Kirkpatrick in Dictatorship and Double Standards, published in Commentary magazine during November 1979. Kirkpatrick criticized the foreign policy of Jimmy Carter, which endorsed detente with the Soviet Union. She later served the Reagan administration as ambassador to the United Nations. Topic. Skepticism towards democracy promotion In «Dictatorship and Double Standards», Kirkpatrick distinguished between authoritarian regimes and the totalitarian regimes such as the Soviet Union. She suggested that in some countries democracy was not tenable and the United States had a choice between endorsing authoritarian governments, which might evolve into democracies, or Marxist-Leninist regimes, which she argued had never been ended once they achieved totalitarian control. In such tragic circumstances, she argued that allying with authoritarian governments might be prudent. Kirkpatrick argued that by demanding rapid liberalization in traditionally autocratic countries, the Carter administration had delivered those countries to Marxist-Leninists that were even more repressive. She further accused the Carter administration of a double standard and of never having applied its rhetoric on the necessity of liberalization to communist governments. The essay compares traditional autocracies and communist regimes. Traditional autocrats do not disturb the habitual rhythms of work and leisure, habitual places of residence, habitual patterns of family and personal relations. Because the miseries of traditional life are familiar, they are bearable to ordinary people who, growing up in the society, learn to cope. Revolutionary communist regimes claim jurisdiction over the whole life of the society and make demands for change that so violate internalized values and habits that inhabitants flee by the tens of thousands. 
Kirkpatrick concluded that while the United States should encourage liberalization and democracy in autocratic countries, it should not do so when the government risks violent overthrow and should expect gradual change rather than immediate transformation. She wrote. No idea holds greater sway in the mind of educated Americans than the belief that it is possible to democratize governments, anytime and anywhere, under any circumstances. Decades, if not centuries, are normally required for people to acquire the necessary disciplines and habits. In Britain, the road to democratic government took seven centuries to traverse. The speed with which armies collapse, bureaucracies abdicate, and social structures dissolve once the autocrat is removed frequently surprises American policymakers. Topic: 1990s. During the 1990s, neoconservatives were once again opposed to the foreign policy establishment, both during the Republican administration of President George H. W. Bush and that of his Democratic successor, President Bill Clinton. Many critics charged that the neoconservatives lost their influence as a result of the end of the Soviet Union, after the decision of George H. W. Bush to leave Saddam Hussein in power after the First Iraq War during 1991. Many neoconservatives considered this policy and the decision not to endorse indigenous dissident groups such as the Kurds and Shiites in their 1991 1992 resistance to Hussein as a betrayal of democratic principles. Some of those same targets of criticism would later become fierce advocates of neoconservative policies. During 1992, referring to the first Iraq War, then United States Secretary of Defense and future Vice President Richard Cheney said, I would guess if we had gone in there, I would still have forces in Baghdad today. We'd be running the country. We would not have been able to get everybody out and bring everybody home. And the question in my mind is how many additional American casualties is Saddam Hussein worth? And the answer is not that damned many. So, I think we got it right, both when we decided to expel him from Kuwait, but also when the president made the decision that we'd achieved our objectives and we were not going to go get bogged down in the problems of trying to take over and govern Iraq. Within a few years of the Gulf War in Iraq, many neoconservatives were endorsing the ouster of Saddam Hussein. On 19 February 1998, an open letter to President Clinton was published, signed by dozens of pundits, many identified with neoconservatism and later related groups such as the Project for the New American Century, urging decisive action to remove Saddam from power. Neoconservatives were also members of the so called Blue Team which argued for a confrontational policy toward the People's Republic of China and strong military and diplomatic endorsement for the Republic of China also known as Formosa or Taiwan. During the late 1990s, Irving Kristol and other writers in neoconservative magazines began touting anti-Darwinist views as an endorsement of intelligent design. Since these neoconservatives were largely of secular origin, a few commentators have speculated that this, along with endorsement of religion generally, may have been a case of a noble lie, intended to protect public morality, or even tactical politics, to attract religious endorsers. Topic: 2000s. Topic: Administration of George W. Bush. The Bush campaign and the early Bush administration did not exhibit strong endorsement of neoconservative principles. As a presidential candidate, Bush had argued for a restrained foreign policy, stating his opposition to the idea of nation building and an early foreign policy confrontation with China was managed without the vociferousness suggested by some neoconservatives. Also early in the administration, some neoconservatives criticized Bush's administration as insufficiently supportive of Israel and suggested Bush's foreign policies were not substantially different from those of President Clinton. Bush's policies changed dramatically immediately after the 11th of September 2001 attacks. During Bush's State of the Union speech of January 2002, he named Iraq, Iran and North Korea as states that constitute an axis of evil. And pose a grave and growing danger." Bush suggested the possibility of preemptive war. I will not wait on events, while dangers gather. I will not stand by, as peril draws closer and closer. 
The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. Some major defense and national security persons have been quite critical of what they believed was a neoconservative influence in getting the United States to go to war against Iraq. Former Nebraska Republican U.S. Senator and Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel, who has been critical of the Bush administration's adoption of neoconservative ideology, in his book America, our next chapter wrote, So why did we invade Iraq? I believe it was the triumph of the so-called neoconservative ideology, as well as Bush administration arrogance and incompetence that took America into this war of choice. They obviously made a convincing case to a president with very limited national security and foreign policy experience, who keenly felt the burden of leading the nation in the wake of the deadliest terrorist attack ever on American soil. <laughs> Bush Doctrine the Bush Doctrine of Preemptive War was stated explicitly in the National Security Council NSC text, "...National Security Strategy of the United States", published 20 September 2002, "...we must deter and defend against the threat before it is unleashed even if uncertainty remains as to the time and place of the enemy's attack." The United States will, if necessary, act preemptively. The choice not to use the word preventive in the 2002 National Security Strategy and instead use the word preemptive was largely in anticipation of the widely perceived illegality of preventive attacks in international law via both charter law and customary law. Policy analysts noted that the Bush Doctrine, as stated in the 2002 NSC document, had a strong resemblance to recommendations presented originally in a controversial defense planning guidance draft written during 1992 by Paul Wolfowitz. During the first Bush administration, the Bush Doctrine was greeted with accolades by many neoconservatives. When asked whether he agreed with the Bush doctrine, Max Boot said he did and that, I think Bush is exactly right to say we can't sit back and wait for the next terrorist strike on Manhattan. We have to go out and stop the terrorists overseas. We have to play the role of the global policeman. But I also argue that we ought to go further. Discussing the significance of the Bush doctrine, neoconservative writer William Crystal claimed, The world is a mess. And, I think, it's very much to Bush's credit that he's gotten serious about dealing with it. The danger is not that we're going to do too much. The danger is that we're going to do too little. <laughs> 2008 presidential election and aftermath John McCain, who was the Republican candidate for the 2008 United States presidential election, endorsed continuing the Second Iraq War, the issue that is most clearly identified with the neoconservatives. The New York Times reported further that his foreign policy views combined elements of neoconservatism and the main competing conservative opinion, pragmatism, also known as realism. Among McCain's advisors are several prominent neoconservatives, including Robert Kagan. Max Boot and John Bolton It may be too strong a term to say a fight is going on over John McCain's soul, said Lawrence Eagleburger, who is a member of the pragmatist camp. But he said, there is no question that a lot of my far-right friends have now decided that since you can't beat him, let's persuade him to slide over as best we can on these critical issues. Barack Obama campaigned for the Democratic nomination during 2008 by attacking his opponents, especially Hillary Clinton, for originally endorsing Bush's Iraq war policies. Obama maintained a selection of prominent military officials from the Bush administration including Robert Gates Bush's defense secretary and David Petraeus Bush's ranking general in Iraq. Topic 2010s By 2010, U.S. forces had switched from combat to a training role in Iraq and they left in 2011. The neocons had little influence in the Obama White House, and neoconservatives have lost much influence in the Republican Party since the rise of Tea Party movement. 
After Donald Trump became the Republican presidential nominee in 2016, many neoconservatives joined Never Trump. Some of the neoconservatives even changed their political stance to support Democrat Hillary Clinton. The Never Trump movement failed after Trump was elected as president. Some of the neoconservatives such as John R. Bolton joined the Trump administration, while many of the neoconservatives continue to oppose the Trump presidency. Evolution of opinions Usage and general views During the early 1970s, socialist Michael Harrington was one of the first to use neoconservative in its modern meaning. He characterized neoconservatives as former leftists, whom he derided as socialists for Nixon, who had become more conservative. These people tended to remain endorsers of social democracy, but distinguished themselves by allying with the Nixon administration with respect to foreign policy, especially by their endorsement of the Vietnam War and opposition to the Soviet Union. They still endorsed the welfare state, but not necessarily in its contemporary form. Irving Kristol remarked that a neoconservative is a liberal mugged by reality, one who became more conservative after seeing the results of liberal policies. Kristol also distinguished three specific aspects of neoconservatism from previous types of conservatism. Neoconservatives had a forward looking attitude from their liberal heritage, rather than the reactionary and dour attitude of previous conservatives. They had ameliorative attitude, proposing alternate reforms rather than simply attacking social liberal reforms, and they took philosophical ideas and ideologies very seriously. During January 2009, at the end of President George W. Bush's second term in office, Jonathan Clark, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs, proposed the following as the main characteristics of neoconservatism. A tendency to see the world in binary good, evil terms. A. Low tolerance for diplomacy. A. Readiness to use military force. An. Emphasis on U.S. unilateral action. A. Disdain for multilateral organizations. And a. Focus on the Middle East. Topic: <inaudible> Opinions concerning foreign policy. In foreign policy, the neoconservatives' main concern is to prevent the development of a new rival. Defense Planning Guidance, a document prepared during 1992 by Under Secretary for Defense for Policy Paul Wolfowitz, is regarded by distinguished professor of the humanities John McGowan at the University of North Carolina as the quintessential statement of neoconservative thought. The report says, our first objective is to prevent the re-emergence of a new rival, either on the territory of the former Soviet Union or elsewhere, that poses a threat on the order of that posed formerly by the Soviet Union. This is a dominant consideration underlying the new regional defense strategy and requires that we endeavor to prevent any hostile power from dominating a region whose resources would, under consolidated control, be sufficient to generate global power. According to lead editor of E-International Relations Stephen McGlinchey, "...neoconservatism is something of a chimera in modern politics." For its opponents it is a distinct political ideology that emphasizes the blending of military power with Wilsonian idealism, yet for its supporters it is more of a persuasion that individuals of many types drift into and out of. Regardless of which is more correct, it is now widely accepted that the neo-conservative impulse has been visible in modern American foreign policy and that it has left a distinct impact." Neoconservatives claim the conviction that communism was a monstrous evil and a potent danger." They endorse social welfare programs that were rejected by libertarians and paleoconservatives. Neoconservatism first developed during the late 1960s as an effort to oppose the radical cultural changes occurring within the United States. Irving Kristol wrote, "...if there is any one thing that neoconservatives are unanimous about, it is their dislike of the counterculture." Norman Podhoretz agreed. Revulsion against the counterculture accounted for more converts to neoconservatism than any other single factor. Neoconservatives began to emphasize foreign issues during the mid 1970s. 
In 1979, an early study by liberal Peter Steinfels concentrated on the ideas of Irving Kristol, Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Daniel Bell. He noted that the stress on foreign affairs emerged after the new left and the counterculture had dissolved as convincing foils for neoconservatism. The essential source of their anxiety is not military or geopolitical or to be found overseas at all, it is domestic and cultural and ideological. Neoconservative foreign policy is a descendant of so called Wilsonian idealism. Neoconservatives endorse democracy promotion by the U.S. and other democracies, based on the claim that they think that human rights belong to everyone. They criticized the United Nations and detente with the Soviet Union. On domestic policy, they endorse a welfare state, like European and Canadian conservatives and unlike American conservatives. According to Norman Podhoretz, the neoconservatives dissociated themselves from the wholesale opposition to the welfare state which had marked American conservatism since the days of the New Deal and while neoconservatives supported setting certain limits to the welfare state, those limits did not involve issues of principle, such as the legitimate size and role of the central government in the American constitutional order but were to be determined by practical considerations. In April 2006, Robert Kagan wrote in the Washington Post that Russia and China may be the greatest challenge liberalism faces today. The main protagonists on the side of autocracy will not be the petty dictatorship of the Middle East theoretically targeted by the Bush Doctrine. They will be the two great autocratic powers, China and Russia, which pose an old challenge not envisioned within the new war on terror paradigm. Their reactions to the color revolutions in Ukraine, Georgia and Kyrgyzstan were hostile and suspicious, and understandably so. Might not the successful liberalization of Ukraine, urged and supported by the Western democracies, be but the prelude to the incorporation of that nation into NATO and the European Union, in short, the expansion of Western liberal hegemony? In July 2008, Joe Klein wrote in Time that today's neoconservatives are more interested in confronting enemies than in cultivating friends. He questioned the sincerity of neoconservative interest in exporting democracy and freedom, saying, Neoconservatism in foreign policy is best described as unilateral bellicosity cloaked in the utopian rhetoric of freedom and democracy. In February 2009, Andrew Sullivan wrote he no longer took neoconservatism seriously because its basic tenet was defense of Israel. The closer you examine it, the clearer it is that neoconservatism, in large part, is simply about enabling the most irredentist elements in Israel and sustaining a permanent war against anyone or any country who disagrees with the Israeli right. That's the conclusion I've been forced to these last few years and to insist that America adopt exactly the same constant war as survival that Israelis have been slowly forced into. But America is not Israel. And once that distinction is made, much of the neoconservative ideology collapses. Neoconservatives respond to charges of merely rationalizing aid for Israel by noting that their position on the Middle East conflict was exactly congruous with the neoconservative position on conflicts everywhere else in the world, including places where neither Jews nor Israeli interests could be found, not to mention the fact that non-Jewish neoconservatives took the same stands on all of the issues as did their Jewish confrères. <laughs> Views on economics While neoconservatism is concerned primarily with foreign policy, there is also some discussion of internal economic policies. Neoconservatism generally endorses free markets and capitalism, favoring supply-side economics, but it has several disagreements with classical liberalism and fiscal conservatism. Irving Kristol states that neocons are more relaxed about budget deficits and tend to reject the Hayekian notion that the growth of government influence on society and public welfare is the road to serfdom. Indeed, to safeguard democracy, government intervention and budget deficits may sometimes be necessary, Crystal argues. Further, neoconservative ideology stresses that while free markets do provide material goods in an efficient way, they lack the moral guidance human beings need to fulfill their needs. Morality can be found only in tradition, they say and contrary to libertarianism markets do pose questions that cannot be solved solely by economics. 
So, as the economy only makes up part of our lives, it must not be allowed to take over and entirely dictate to our society. Critics consider neoconservatism a bellicose and heroic ideology opposed to mercantile and bourgeois virtues and therefore a variant of anti economic thought. Political scientist Zeev Sternhull states. Neoconservatism has succeeded in convincing the great majority of Americans that the main questions that concern a society are not economic, and that social questions are really moral questions. <laughs> <laughs> Friction with other conservatives Many moderate conservatives oppose neoconservative policies and have sharply negative views on it. For example, Stephen Halper and Jonathan Clark, a libertarian based at Cato, in their 2004 book on neoconservatism, America Alone, the Neoconservatives and the Global Order, characterized the neoconservatives at that time as uniting around three common themes. A belief deriving from religious conviction that the human condition is defined as a choice between good and evil and that the true measure of political character is to be found in the willingness by the former themselves to confront the latter. An assertion that the fundamental determinant of the relationship between states rests on military power and the willingness to use it. A primary focus on the Middle East and global Islam as the principal theater for American overseas interests. In putting these themes into practice, neoconservatives analyze international issues in black and white, absolute moral categories. They are fortified by a conviction that they alone hold the moral high ground and argue that disagreement is tantamount to defeatism. Focus on the unipolar power of the United States, seeing the use of military force as the first, not the last, option of foreign policy. They repudiate the lessons of Vietnam, which they interpret as undermining American will toward the use of force, and embrace the lessons of Munich, interpreted as establishing the virtues of preemptive military action. Disdain conventional diplomatic agencies such as the State Department and conventional country-specific, realist, and pragmatic, analysis. They are hostile toward non-military multilateral institutions and instinctively antagonistic toward international treaties and agreements. Global unilateralism is their watchword. They are fortified by international criticism, believing that it confirms American virtue. Look to the Reagan administration as the exemplar of all these virtues and seek to establish their version of Reagan's legacy as the Republican and National Orthodoxy. Topic: <laughs> Friction with paleoconservatism. Starting during the 1980s, disputes concerning Israel and public policy contributed to a conflict with paleoconservatives. Pat Buchanan terms neoconservatism a globalist, interventionist, open borders ideology. Paul Gottfried has written that the neocons call for permanent revolution, exists independently of their beliefs about Israel, characterizing the NEOS as ranters out of a Dostoyevskian novel, who are out to practice permanent revolution courtesy of the U.S. government, and questioning how anyone could mistake them for conservatives. What make neocons most dangerous are not their isolated ghetto hang-ups, like hating Germans and Southern whites and calling everyone and his cousin an anti-Semite, but the leftist revolutionary fury they express. He has also argued that domestic equality and the exportability of democracy are points of contention between them. Responding to a question about neoconservatives in 2004, William F. Buckley said, I think those I know, which is most of them, are bright, informed and idealistic, but that they simply overrate the reach of U.S. power and influence. Trotskyism allegation Critics have argued that since the founders of neoconservatism included ex-Trotskyists, Trotskyist traits continue to characterize neoconservative ideologies and practices. During the Reagan administration, the charge was made that the foreign policy of the Reagan administration was being managed by ex-Trotskyists. This claim was called a myth by Lipset, 1988, p. 34. This Trotskyist charge was repeated and widened by journalist Michael Lind during 2003 to assert a takeover of the foreign policy of the George W. Bush administration by former Trotskyists, Lind's 
Amalgamation of the defense intellectuals with the traditions and theories of the largely Jewish American Trotskyist movement, in Lin's words, was criticized during 2003 by University of Michigan professor Alan M. Wald, who had discussed Trotskyism in his history of the New York intellectuals. The charge that neoconservatism is related to Leninism has also been made. Francis Fukuyama identified neoconservatism with Leninism during 2006. He wrote that neoconservatives believed that history can be pushed along with the right application of power and will substantially analogous to will to power of Nietzschean memory. Leninism was a tragedy in its Bolshevik version, and it has returned as farce when practiced by the United States. Neoconservatism, as both a political symbol and a body of thought, has evolved into something I can no longer support. Criticisms The term, neoconservative, may be used pejoratively by self described pale conservatives, Democrats, liberals, progressives, realists, or libertarians. Critics take issue with neoconservatives' support for interventionistic foreign policy. Critics from the left take issue with what they characterize as unilateralism and lack of concern with international consensus through organizations such as the United Nations. Critics from both the left and right have assailed neoconservatives for the role Israel plays in their policies on the Middle East. Neoconservatives respond by describing their shared opinion as a belief that national security is best attained by actively promoting freedom and democracy abroad, as in the democratic peace theory, through the endorsement of democracy, foreign aid, and in certain cases, military intervention. This is different from the traditional conservative tendency to endorse friendly regimes in matters of trade and anti-communism even at the expense of undermining existing democratic systems. Republican Congressman Ron Paul has been a longtime critic of neoconservatism as an attack on freedom and the Constitution, including an extensive speech on the House floor addressing neoconservative beginnings and how neoconservatism is neither new nor conservative. In a column named, Years of Shame. Commemorating the 10th anniversary of 9-11 attacks, Paul Krugman criticized the neoconservatives for causing a war unrelated to 9-11 attacks and fought for wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Imperialism and secrecy John McGowan, professor of humanities at the University of North Carolina, states after an extensive review of neoconservative literature and theory that neoconservatives are attempting to build an American empire, seen as successor to the British Empire, its goal being to perpetuate a Pax Americana. As imperialism is largely considered unacceptable by the American media, neoconservatives do not articulate their ideas and goals in a frank manner in public discourse. McGowan states, Frank neoconservatives like Robert Kaplan and Niall Ferguson recognize that they are proposing imperialism as the alternative to liberal internationalism. Yet both Kaplan and Ferguson also understand that imperialism runs so counter to Americans' liberal tradition that it must remain a foreign policy that dare not speak its name. While Ferguson, the Brit, laments that Americans cannot just openly shoulder the white man's burden, Kaplan the American, tells us that only through stealth and anxious foresight can the United States continue to pursue the imperial reality that already dominates our foreign policy, but must be disavowed in light of our anti-imperial traditions, and the fact that imperialism is delegitimized in public discourse. The Bush administration, justifying all of its actions by an appeal to national security has kept as many of those actions as it can secret and has scorned all limitations to executive power by other branches of government or international law. <laughs> Antisemitism and dual loyalty In the run-up to the 2003 invasion of Iraq, charges of dual loyalty were leveled against Jewish neoconservatives from across the political spectrum. A heated debate ensued and the controversy continues into the present due to concerns over neoconservatives' stance toward Iran. 
An ABC News article providing an overview of the debate in the run up to the Iraq War stated Critics of U.S. Iraq policy, on the right and the left, have drawn accusations of anti Semitism for asserting that certain members of Bush's administration, namely Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, Chairman of the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board, and Douglas Faith, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, have dual loyalty, interests in both the United States and Israel. Patrick Buchanan issued a statement in a cover article for the American conservative, "...neocons say we attack them because they are Jewish. We do not. We attack them because their warmongering threatens our country, even as it finds a reliable echo in Ariel Sharon." Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic interviewed Joe Klein in 2008. My friend and former colleague Joe Klein has made himself quite the figure of controversy over the past few weeks. First, he suggested that Jewish neoconservatives have divided loyalties. Then, he argued that McCain has surrounded himself with Jewish neoconservatives who want war with Iran. Joe Klein issued a refutation of the charges, stating that he was anti neoconservative. Listen, people can vote whichever way they want, for whatever reason they want. I just don't want to see policy makers who make decisions on the basis of whether American policy will benefit Israel or not. In some cases, you want to provide protection for Israel certainly, but you don't want to go to war with Iran. When Jennifer Rubin or Abe Foxman calls me anti-Semitic, they're wrong. I am anti-neoconservative. I think these people are following very perversely extremist policies and I really did believe that it was time for mainstream Jews to stand up and say, they don't represent us, they don't represent Israel. Mickey Cause of Slate noted that. Max Boot, Pete Wenner, Jennifer Rubin, Paul Mirangoff and Abraham Foxman of the Anti-Defamation League all wrote confidently outraged responses to Klein's raising of the divided loyalties, and went on to opine that it should be possible to publicly debate whether some Jewish neoconservatives, among others, too easily convinced themselves that America's and Israel's interests happily coincided in the prosecution of the war. Glenn Greenwald also issued a response in support of Klein, as I've documented previously, the very same right-wing advocates who scream, anti-Semitism, at anyone, such as Klein, who raises the issue of devotion to Israel themselves constantly argue that American Jews do, and should, cast their votes in American elections based upon what is best for Israel. They nakedly trot out the, dual loyalty. Argument in order to manipulate American Jews to vote Republican in U.S. elections, e.g. The GOP supports Israel and Obama doesn't, therefore, American Jews shouldn't vote for Obama. While screaming, anti-Semitism, the minute the premise is used by their political opponents. David Brooks derided the fantasies of full mooners fixated on a sort of Yiddish trilateral commission, beliefs which had hardened into common knowledge. He rebutted those beliefs, saying that People labeled neocons con is short for conservative and neo is short for Jewish travel in widely different circles. The neo prefix actually means new from the Greek word neos with the same meaning. Barry Rubin argued that the neoconservative label is used as an anti-Semitic pejorative. First, neoconservative is a codeword for Jewish. As anti-Semites did with big business moguls in the 19th century and communist leaders in the 20th, the trick here is to take all those involved in some aspect of public life and single out those who are Jewish. The implication made is that this is a Jewish-led movement conducted not in the interests of all the, in this case, American people, but to the benefit of Jews, and in this case Israel. Notable people associated with neoconservatism The list includes public people identified as personally neoconservative at an important time or a high official with numerous neoconservative advisors, such as George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. Politicians George W. Bush, R. 46th Governor of Texas, 1995 to 2000, 43rd President of the United States, 2001 to 2009, son of George H. W. Bush, 41st President of the United States, and former First Lady Barbara Bush. 
Jeb Bush, R, 43rd Governor of Florida, 1999 to 2007, 2016 presidential candidate, brother of former President George W. Bush, second son of former President George H. W. Bush and former First Lady Barbara Bush. Dick Cheney, R, White House Chief of Staff, 1975 to 1977, Representative from Wyoming, 1979 to 1989, 17th United States Secretary of Defense, 1989 to 1993, 46th Vice President of the United States, 2001 to 2009. Liz Cheney, R, State Department official, 2002 to 2008, and Representative from Wyoming, 2017 present. Joe Lieberman, I, 21st Attorney General of Connecticut, 1983 to 1989, Senator from Connecticut, 1989 to 2013, 2000 Democratic Vice Presidential nominee and 2004 Presidential candidate. John McCain, R, Representative from Arizona, 1983 to 1987, Senator, 1987 to 2018, 2000 Presidential candidate and 2008 Republican Presidential nominee. Tim Pawlenty, R, 39th Governor of Minnesota, 2003 to 2011, and 2012 presidential candidate. Marco Rubio, R, Speaker of the Florida House of Representatives, 2006 to 2008, Senator from Florida, 2011 present, and 2016 presidential candidate. Lindsey Graham, R, former United States Air Force Colonel, representative from South Carolina, 1995 to 2003, Senator, 2003 present, and 2016 presidential candidate. Mike Pompeo, R, representative from Kansas, 2011 to 2017, Director of the CIA, 2017-2018, and United States Secretary of State, 2018 present. Topic Government officials: Elliot Abrams, R, Foreign Policy Advisor; William Bennett, R, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, 1981 to 1985, Director of the National Drug Control Policy, 1989-1990, and U.S. Secretary of Education, 1985 to 1988. Elliot A. Cohen, State Department Counselor, 2007 to 2009, now Robert E. Osgood Professor of Strategic Studies at the Paul H. Nitze School of Advanced International Studies at the Johns Hopkins University. Jean Kirkpatrick, R, Ambassador to the United Nations, 1981 to 1985. Scooter Libby, R, Chief of Staff to Dick Cheney, 2001 to 2005. Richard Pearl, R, Assistant Secretary of Defense and Lobbyist. Paul Wolfowitz, R, State and Defense Department Official. R, James Woolsey Jr., D, 16th Director of Central Intelligence, 1993 to 1995, Under Secretary of the Navy, 1977 to 1979, and Green Energy Lobbyist. John R. Bolton R Ambassador to the United Nations 2005-2006 National Security Advisor to Donald Trump since 2018 Topic <laughs> Academics Victor Davis Hanson, Martin and Illy Anderson Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution Columnist and Author Michael Ledeen, Freedom Scholar Chair at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, former U.S. Government Consultant, Author and Columnist Nathan Glazer, Professor of Sociology, Columnist and Author Donald Kagan, Sterling Professor of Classics and History at Yale University Andrew Roberts, Professor of History at King's College in London Topic. Public figures. Robert Kagan, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution, historian, founder of the Yale Political Monthly, advisor to Republican political campaigns and one of 25 members of an advisory board to Hillary Clinton at the State Department Kagan calls himself a liberal interventionist, rather than neoconservative. Arthur Brooks, President of the American Enterprise Institute Danielle Pletka, Senior Vice President of the American Enterprise Institute for Foreign and Defense Studies and former member of Senate Foreign Relations Committee 
Gary Schmidt, resident scholar, co-director of the Maryland Ware Center for Security Studies and director of the Program on American Citizenship at the American Enterprise Institute, former executive director, project for the New American Century, executive director for President Reagan's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board and White House The Weekly Standard Fred Barnes, executive editor of the news publication The Weekly Standard David Frum, journalist, Republican speech writer and columnist Jonah Goldberg, columnist for National Review Frederick Kagan, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute Charles Krauthammer, deceased Pulitzer Prize winner, columnist and physician Irving Kristol, deceased publisher, journalist and columnist William Kristol, founder and editor of The Weekly Standard, professor of political philosophy and American politics and political advisor Joshua Muravchik, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute Douglas Murray, British writer, journalist and political commentator Daniel Pipes, former neoconservative, historian, writer and political commentator Norman Podhoretz, editor-in-chief of Commentary John Podhoretz, editor-at-large of Commentary, presidential speech writer and author Jennifer Rubin, columnist and blogger for The Washington Post Michael Rubin, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute Erwin Stelzer, international economics and business columnist, editor at the Weekly Standard and Oxford Fellow Jonathan S. Tobin, senior online editor of Commentary <laughs> Related publications and institutions Topic. Institutions American Enterprise Institute Foundation for Defense of Democracies Henry Jackson Society Hudson Institute Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs Project for the New American Century topic. Publications Commentary The Public Interest Out of Circulation The Washington Free Beacon The Weekly Standard Topic See also Alt Light British Neoconservatism Democratic Peace Theory Factions in the Republican Party United States Globalization Interventionism Neoconservatism and Paleoconservatism Neoconservatism in Japan Neoconservatism in the Czech Republic Neolibertarianism New Right Liberal Hawk Liberal Internationalism Paleoconservatism Project for a New American Century Tory Socialism Trotskyism Notes <laughs>